I'm glad we all got here safely with the rain and spring has to be right around the corner. Um, I'll turn it over to Dr. McComas. Okay, okay great, thank you everyone. Uh, we'd like to jump right. Good evening, everyone. I'd like to jump right into today's agenda. Um, and we're gonna start off with a literacy overview. Um, and as Ms. Shea is coming forward um, and getting herself situated, i just like to talk about, you know, many of the things that we do in BCPS and many of the topics that we will be discussing today and over time deal with our systemic literacy, <laughs> which is a core mission, it's a core function of the part of a school system. And so today we want to start out by really helping our committee members and anyone who, who might look at the minutes understand sort of the fundamentals of literacy instruction. Um, and part of that, um, what we'll wrap up is we'll talk about our um, phonics pilot that we've been running, which I know is a specific request. And what I've asked Ms. Shea to do is rather than jump right into that as a singular isolated item, what I want to do is build your larger understanding so that as we're talking about phonics or comprehension, you have a sense of how that fits together. So I just wanted to explain why we're entering the conversation this way. And I will say, Dr. McComas, as I've been out to schools, um, I have had a wonderful opportunity at each school to look at um, the, the, the work that's being done around early literacy. Mm -hmm. I, I noticed that two schools seem to be following, I mean, the way the kids sat and everything, the mm -hmm. exact same model. And another school was the same content, but in a little bit different format. Mm -hmm. So I do know from the schools I've been to, um, that there is quite a focus on literacy. Wonderful, thank you. And thank you for um, sharing that with us. And, and um, I'm excited to hear that as you're out and about, you're gonna see more and more things that are gonna become more familiar to you and you'll become more versed in that. And that's part of what we hope today's literacy helps you um, in that process. So I think we have passed out our um, resources that Ms. Shea will be working with us through. We secretly really love the opportunity to teach. Yeah, <laughs> or not maybe, so secretly, maybe not right? secretly, right? <laughs> anyway, good afternoon, everyone. Um, so as Dr. McComas said, we're gonna talk about literacy um, today, specifically around learning to read. And the reason that I call that out is because um, we actually do a lot more within English language arts in terms of that large block, and especially in the elementary school, it represents a significant portion of the school day, um, which is why you, um, you're gonna hear a lot of different products, a little, lot of different standards, a lot of different approaches. Um, so my objective is really to talk about an overview of just how complex this is, um, because learning to read and teaching children to read is very complex and multifaceted, um, in particular when we're trying to be responsive to the population of students that we serve. And so my hope is that by um, really doing um, a good job of explaining those complexities, I can set the framework for future conversations around curriculum, around instructional materials, around contracts, professional learning, so that you can see where that fits in the scope of what's actually happening in those classrooms when you visit. Um, and then we also want to talk specifically about what some of those approaches are and some of the materials and how that relates to the specific profiles of readers that we serve. Um, so you have have a handout in front of you that I just wanted to frame as the broad context. This is um, the framework of the core instructional pro, um, components of the English language arts block. And I call it a block. It's typically scheduled as one consistent block, but sometimes it may be broken up as the schools see fit. And um, what we've done down the left-hand column, that first column talks about the different instructional components. So you'll see that we address things um, in terms of reading and then also written language. So you'll see phonics and word study, which we're gonna talk more about today. You'll see shared learning experiences where we talk about read alouds and um, shared reading. You'll also see small group experiences all the way through to some of the writing components. 
And I just wanted to give you that handout just as a backbone for some of what we talk about with English language arts. You'll also see then at different grade levels the amount of time approximated for each of those components can wax and wane depending on developmentally what it is we're trying to accomplish. And then in the last column it just talks about what are really the objectives. What are we trying to teach during this block of time? Um, because hopefully that will also frame that um, it's important that teachers choose um, instructional methods or approaches. Ms. Mack, you mentioned sometimes whether they're on the carpet or in there in small group at a kidney table in the back of the room all of those are decisions that teachers make regarding these components so I share this really just as a background um, framework for all of you um, this is a resource that's directly given with teachers we've done a lot of professional development it's shared with administrators in terms of making the schedule um, but it helps also to frame our curriculum and instructional materials so with that, I'm going to be focusing specifically, as I said, on the parts of those components that are talking about reading. And so I wanted to start with um, just having a conversation about what do we mean by reading? I'm not clicking, Jeremy, would you mind? That's okay. Thank you. So I wanted to really start by talking about what is reading. And the reason, I know that sounds like it's an oversimplification, um, but when we talk about the teaching of reading, it's actually very complex. And so for a long time, there was um, in education circles what we now lovingly refer to as the reading wars. You've heard of the mommy wars, maybe? This was really the reading wars about whether or not is it more important to teach children to decode, or is it about teaching them to love literature and immersing them in comprehension? And for a long time in education, the pendulum swung back and forth between those two different approaches for teaching reading. If you think about your own schooling, when you were learning to read, you may have been in a basal type approach where you had the um, Jane, C. Jane <laughs> run type approach, or some of us learned in a more phonics-based approach. What this formula um, does is to try to address that it's really a both and conversation. So this was first introduced back in the 80s by two researchers that were trying to address these reading wars by saying it's actually a product. So you'll see that multiplication sign. Um, it's a product of both. It's a product of decoding or your ability to actually make sense of the printed words and their sounds and sound that out together and language comprehension, which is the ability to process those words and make meaning. Um, and it's important to note that it's a product because as and we know with our math, if either of those numbers were zero, we know that anything times zero is zero. And so what they found over time is that when we're talking about overall comprehension, if either one of these is a significant area of weakness or deficit for a reader, then reading overall will fail, or students will struggle. What researchers went on then to do is to do is to talk about how that's what we call the simple view of reading but it's actually much more complex so if you will indulge me I'm actually going to walk you through this model is from a researcher named Hollis Scarborough and Hollis Scarborough said that it's actually more appropriate to think about this as a rope so you have in front of you pipe cleaners um, so those of you that are tactile kinesthetic learners will have an opportunity to engage that way and so I want you to think of each of these pipe cleaners as one strand or one piece of that rope. And so down on the bottom, under the area of the rope that's called word recognition, this is when, in the simple view, we talked about decoding. This is about the idea of just recognizing that um, letters have sounds and sounds come together to make words. And so our superintendent at the last board meeting also talked about the five areas of reading. So I'm going to talk to you about the overlay of these different strands as those five areas. So the first is to think about that phonological awareness. Phonological Logical awareness, I'm going to ask you to take your orange so you can match. Um, this is just an awareness of sound. If you think of that root phone meaning sound, this is that um, we are, as our brains are hardwired for sound. So when you think about language when babies are first born, they are hardwired to make and hear sound. And so phonological awareness is that awareness that words and language are made up of sounds and that we can manipulate those sounds. So when you about things like rhyming words or compound words or even just understanding that if I want to look at individual letters I have to blend those sounds together to be able to read that whole word and that's what we call phonemic awareness is the very smallest unit of sound the next area though is to think about on the rope when we think about decoding and spelling now we have to bring in printed text 
And so where printed text meets sound, that's what we call phonics. So now we're saying to students, I want you to look at this letter. This letter has a name, the letter is B. It looks like this, but it makes the B sound. So now we're connecting sounds and letter names and the visual representations of sounds. And that's called phonics. And sight recognition, you may hear, those of you who've had young children or maybe um, remember from your own days, we talk about sight words. So we, there are some words that we want our children to not have to decode. Those words happen so frequently that we want them to recognize them by sight. And so you'll see on the bottom of that rope, we want both of these to become increasingly automatic. So what I'm gonna ask you to do is to kind of twist those two together because through fluency and through instruction and repeated practice, we have help our students to make this process of connecting that letter visual and name, that printed orthography with the sound so that it becomes automatic. So that all falls under word recognition. But as we saw in our simple view, that's not enough. So once we have braided those together and students are really learning to become increasingly more automatic around word recognition and the sounds, we also have to attend to the idea of language comprehension. So that's at the top half of the rope. So this is a, the idea about students have to recognize and produce these words, but then they have to understand what do they mean. So letters come together to make words, words come together to make sentences, and so on and so forth. And so we start with this idea of one of the big areas of reading is vocabulary. And so we know that vocabulary knowledge is critically important to understanding. And so we teach students a variety of strategies around understanding vocabulary, but also around word learning. So how can we use the structures of words, roots or endings or prefixes to help us understand how words work? Um, so vocabulary is represented with the yellow. Once we understand those words and recognize those words, we want to think about what they mean. Comprehension goes beyond just individual words because now we bring in several other strands. So um, I've mentioned before that one of the um, biggest indicators of how well you were understand a text, no matter how complex, is how much did you know about that topic before you sat down. So if you think about your own learning, all of us have hobbies or interests. Um, I can read a text that's very complex about reading because I have a strong background knowledge. But if you give me a really um, complex text about, say, football, I'm going to struggle a little bit more because I just don't have that same background knowledge. I'm gaining it. I have two boys, but I don't have it quite yet. So background knowledge is a part of comprehension. Um, and the other piece that's a part of comprehension is the structure of language. We call that the rules of the road. So how come certain parts, we have to have a subject and a predicate. Um, uh, one clear example of this is we teach kids when they're very little that they can't start a sentence with the word because. But we know as adults, is that true? No, you can start a sentence with the word because. It's just a more complex sentence structure, and our youngest learners aren't aware of that. Um, so we teach not only comprehension of word meaning and background knowledge, but we also teach about language structures and what we call literacy knowledge. We want all of those to come together in inc becoming increasingly automatic and increasingly strategic. So I'm going to ask you to take the language comprehension pieces together with the word recognition pieces, and I want you to just twist those together. Because in Scarborough's Rope, what we talk about is that that process of reading is multifaceted, and it's acquired over years, over repeated practice, over systematic and explicit instruction. And the idea is that we're trying to build skilled readers that have a very tight, cohesive rope that then they can take into those deeper contents when we talk about disciplinary literacy so that they are proficient and skilled at all these pieces that come together with reading. Now, this may surprise some of you that it's actually that complex because some of us as readers, this came pretty easily to us. We are skilled and have proficient readers. But I want you to imagine for a moment, as you're looking at your rope, pull any color, just pull one strand and I want you to yank it out a little bit. Just make a hole. Just twist, pull it out. I know. I know. Well, that's how some of our readers feel, right? <laughs> OK. And then just hold it up and show each other which one you pulled. Yeah. So that beautiful rope that was skilled and proficient took together, each of us now has a gap somewhere in that rope as a reader. 
all of us are struggling as readers, but as we look around, we might see that that gap or that deficit happens in a different place. So for example, my gap is in the area of phonemic awareness. So as a reader, I might have very strong language and listening comprehension. I might have lots of background knowledge. I may have um, been read to as a child and have a really strong background knowledge. Maybe I've gone to lots of museums and experienced things, but I have a weakness in that sound area. So at some point, I'm going to struggle with that word recognition, whereas some of our readers might struggle in other areas. And so what we've been learning over time and what we've been helping our teachers to understand is that this nature of this complex nature of reading actually engages different parts of the brain. So with the advancements in neuroscience, we actually now have, as part of the reading research field, pictures of children and adult readers' brains and what's happening in their brain when they read. Um, and in those functional MRIs, children go in and adults go in, and while they're in that MRI machine, they're actually reading. And they're taking pictures of what's happening in the systems of the brain when we're engaged in reading. And then we're comparing what's different about the brains of readers that struggle. And so you can see there's four different processors in the brain that correspond to different colors on our rope. So in in the Broca's area, this is the phonological processor. This is the part of the brain that's responsible for speech sound. If you look towards the back of the brain in that occipital lobe, that's where the orthographic processor is. So that's the part of your brain that sees lines and curves come together and form a letter that we recognize as the letter B. Those two processors have to connect so that we can take that printed letter and know that it makes a sound and put it together. And then you can see the two um, that sound symbol place that it comes together. That's that upper portion of the brain called the angular gyrus. So we have the phonological processor and the orthographic or print processor come together so that we can actually decode. Wernicke's area down on the bottom, this is where our context and meaning processor. This gets really complex because what we know is we have multiple meaning words and multiple vocabulary. So I share this because re teaching reading is really difficult and there is a lot that needs to come together. Um, and what we know though from science is that we can as teachers actually reprogram their brains. So when I talked about the functional MRIs that we've seen of a striving reader, what we see is that sometimes the wrong part of their brain is engaging and trying to process sound. What we know is that through systematic and explicit instruction, we can actually reprogram that. It's pretty cool, reading teachers as neuroscientists. So when we think about how does this show up in a classroom, I want you to think about those different colors that we've put together as skilled readers. We want this type of um, reading proficiency to occur along a continuum. So I talked about the two main, that simple view of decoding versus comprehension or the two sides of the rope. Decoding is going to occur along a continuum from poor to good. It's not you either have it or you don't. You're somewhere along that continuum. We want all of our readers to get all the way over to good, to have that strong, solid part of the rope. Comprehension is going to occur along a very similar continuum from poor to good. So as we develop background knowledge and vocabulary and language comprehension, our goal as teachers is to strengthen that comprehension for all readers. When we think about the profiles of the readers in our classroom, we can start by thinking about these four quadrants. So we have some readers that are poor in decoding and poor in comprehension. So they have what we sometimes refer to as double deficits or double areas that we're working on. We also have readers that may be poor decoders but actually have very strong comprehension. They are very strong. If you read it aloud, they can tell you exactly what's happening. They can make inferences. They can speak very knowledgeably about um, a topic. They struggle with the actual phonological processing or that phonics. Many of these students are those that identify as having dyslexia. And so they have a very unique need. We've talked a lot about how dyslexia is in no way a reflection of intelligence. Many incredibly gifted and creative readers fall in this quadrant where they have exceptional um, comprehension of language, but they struggle with that decoding. Can I ask a question? You sure can. So what happens to the kids who make it through second grade um, and they, they take tests where sometimes the questions are read to them. Mm -hmm. And then suddenly, if I'm correct, at th in third grade, 
they're required to read the question and take the test and and they may not have achieved a great level right. of they still have good comprehension, but they still struggle with decoding. Absolutely, and you raise a really good point because we do have one particular, one of our assessments map does do that, um, which is why it's critically important, and I, I'm glad you said that because you reminded me, we need diagnostic assessment support for all of these parts, which is why over time we've built multiple checkpoints because we do have some readers where we sometimes see a dip in our third grade for just the reason you identified. Children who we thought were learning the code and were making meaning, when we take away that support, that audit support, what we find is they actually have a gap. And so what we do is we have layers of diagnostics for teachers. We've spent the last two or three years identifying different tools to help our teachers diagnose so that we don't end up in a place where we're much more prepared to identify these students have strengths and weaknesses in these different areas so that when that shows up as a comprehension area, we're able to figure out, is it comprehension or was it that their decoding was not as strong as we thought? Um, but that would still give us more information because if they were strong in comprehension when they had that auditory support, they probably are not in that bottom left quadrant because to your point, they had strong comprehension, they just didn't have strong decoding. So that helps us as teachers have information about what are their needs and what do they look like. In the past, in years past, and we've been doing a lot of work on this, but we still have work to go, we would lump all kids in the same spot. Anybody that struggled with reading would go in the same room with the same teacher with the same approach. And that wasn't working because for the students you just described, they don't need help with comprehension. They were really strong when they had that auditory support. The students you describe are probably in that upper left-hand quadrant where their decoding was never mastered. The other thing that's important to note is that some of our students are able to compensate. So um, early readers learn compensation strategies where they recognize by sight and they use picture cues. And so they're kind of hanging in there and holding their own until they get to a point where the text, and often it does happen around third grade, jumps in complexity and they're not able to compensate that way anymore. So it's important that we provide our teachers with lots of different tools to diagnose exactly that and to then be equipped with the right approach instructionally and the right materials to fill that gap. But we don't, I'm hoping that we don't wait until that happens in third exactly. grade. We don't, and that's why we've built lots of different diagnostics. For a long time, that was the case. I mean, we, we have heard a lot from parents of students who um, we have tried to have a one-size-fits-all approach to reading in how we measure it, but also in terms of how we diagnose what supports they need and how we plan for it. Um, so we have put in universal screeners in kindergarten and in first grade. We have purchased diagnostic, you'll hear of like the benchmark assessment system, where we have benchmark books where teachers are actually sitting and listening to students read beginning in kindergarten and first and second grade so that that's not the first moment that we see where they've fallen off the tracks because we can't afford to wait. What we need to continue to do is to build capacity for our teachers to use all those tools. And I'm going to talk about how one of the contracts this board just helped me support is helping teachers pull all that together. Remember we talked about that coaching? Mm -hmm. um, that was really about there's a lot going on with readers. How do we help teachers pull all of that together? Um, so just coming back to this quadrant, we do also have a population of readers um, that have um, actually improved in their, um, they have not improved in their decoding, um, but they have improved in their, um, I'm sorry, they've improved in their decoding. So these are what we call sometimes the word callers, um, but their comprehension is still struggling. Um, these students sometimes trick us as well, because when they read aloud in class, they sound great. And then when they finish and you say, so tell me about what you read, crickets. They don't necessarily make meaning, and I'm going to talk a little bit about how we're learning more and more about how we can support that through our partnership with um, special education as well. So obviously this upper right quadrant, this is the goal. This is what we want. We want good decoding and good comprehension so that we can build skilled readers then prepared to apply that to all the rich content across the discipline so that they can actually engage um, in that learning as well. Research nationally, and a lot of the data we have in Baltimore County fits the same way, is that our striving readers fall in these three quadrants that I um, referenced in different proportionalities. But what we know is that they're not all the same. So nationally, the research says the majority of striving readers do have deficits in both areas. But oftentimes, they didn't start out that way. They actually may have started out as just having an area, a weakness in one area, but they didn't get the right instruction. And so then over time, both their decoding and their 
comprehension have weakened. Um, we know that we have a population of students, specifically those identified as dyslexic, but then students who have what we also refer to as a specific word reading disability, where they're actually very bright in their language comprehension. When they have that auditory support, they're able to make meaning, um, but they need that decoding support. Um, and then, like I said, we do have a small population of students that I'm going to come back to in a bit. Um, who are those word callers? They sound beautiful, but they struggle to be able to make meaning. So what happens, we might think, well, if we know we have these three profiles, why don't we just teach them separately? Why don't we just fill in the hole? The problem with that is if we don't teach all readers to decode, eventually that decoding catches up with them. And then what started out as being one particular area of deficit then becomes we're weakening over time. And the reason for that is when we teach decoding, we often use what's called decodable text or predictable text. That text may not be complex or at grade level. And so what we find sometimes in our secondary grades is that students have been maybe pulled out for a, an intervention in phonics, and they have not been exposed to that complex grade level text. And so then they have gaps in some of that top rope with background knowledge because maybe they didn't have the science instruction or they didn't participate in the shared read aloud for social studies. And that content gap will, over time, cause them to suffer with comprehension struggles as well. We also know that if we um, don't teach our readers comprehension, if we just teach them decoding, then they will lose the ability to make meaning. And that population of students whose comprehension is weak will lag. And we will actually have more students who are struggling with comprehension. They will become those really good word callers who, at the end of the reading, can't tell you anything about that, what they've read. So what we know is that this is our goal. We want the majority of our kids to be in this upper right quadrant where they have strong phonemic awareness, strong phonics, fluently, they're able to make meaning and they can comprehend. You'll notice on this graphic that there still always are going to be students that need that intervention or that tiered support that have specific areas of concern. That's not going to disappear. But what we know right now is we have too many students that are showing up because we have to strengthen that core so that all students have that systematic instruction up front and then provide a menu of options for teachers and reading specialists and special educators to use to provide that targeted support. So when we think about our curriculum materials, um, about six years ago now, we identified a core anthology resource. And when they were going through the process, and I was not in the office at the time, um, and they were looking at different materials, you can imagine that when you think about all these different strands, it is going to be challenging to find one core that's going to equally address all of these strands. Wonders is our core resource that supports the curriculum for English language arts in the elementary school grades. And there are some really strong resources aligned to standards to address that comprehension for our students. But what we know is it's not enough. For students that are in some of these other areas that have targeted needs, they need, in addition to that, that targeted support. So through the vision of our superintendent and our partnership with special education and certainly the support of the board, we've been able to build in and braid funds with special education to provide targeted supports for some of these other profiles. So one in particular is Orton Gillingham. We're very proud of the work we've been able to do in partnership with special education to train teachers in every building to be able to provide Orton Gillingham instruction, which is a direct match for students in that top left quadrant, students who need that systematic explicit phonics instruction. Can I ask you a question? You sure can. Um, I've heard nothing but good things about Orton Gillingham, yes. and I know that we our goal is to have teachers in every school. Yes. But what prevents us from having el every elementary teacher trained in Orton Gillingham? Because I would think when kids move from other schools, when they move from other systems, right. um, every teacher could benefit from having that. Absolutely. And so there's two answers to your question. Um, Oh, time and money are always going to be factors. So we continue to have a plan. It's not a one-shot deal. And so I believe Rebecca Ryder's behind me, so she's probably nodding. But we, um, over time, we continue. We don't plan to stop. We continue to um, roll that out. And when I say time, though, remember, um, although this was at a CCAC meeting, Orton Gillingham training is 60 hours. So it is a big commitment where we're pulling teachers out of classrooms with kids. And so that's a part of it. So it's not that we can't ever, and we do have a commitment to continue to do that and 
And maybe someday we'll realize that goal, although with teacher turnover, it's a moving target. Um, so we will continue to expand. But the other piece is that we do have a plan um, with our letters training that is founded on the same principles of Horton Killingham, does have all teachers. We need all teachers. And there's some legislation to help at the university level have all teachers have that basic understanding, some of which I shared with you today. So that Scarborough's rope, the reading in the brain, that's a part of that training so that all teachers have that multi-sensory training approach um, because we know it's successful. But the other piece that I want to um, talk about, and I actually had this conversation about a year and a half ago, um, Ms. Ryder and I were trying to explain, we don't want to make the mistake of the past and put every student in an Orton-Gillingham tier three intervention. Because if you're a student who's in that right quadrant where you have strong decoding, but you're weak in comprehension, that is not going to meet your needs. It's not going to tighten your part of the rope. And those classrooms are going to be overrun. Teachers are not going to have that small group teacher-student ratio that we know is so important. So we have to be careful that while it is wonderful and does have benefits, and we want all teachers to have that basic understanding, we have to continue to provide that menu so that the right kid is in the right fit class for the materials that fill that need. No, I understand that. Sure. I just think about in any job, people bring a toolbox to their job. Absolutely. And it, it's, it would be something to have in a Absolutely. teacher's toolbox. And it will. And we will continue along our pathway to do that. And to your point, there's lots of tools that we want to put in that same toolbox. Um, uh, let me just jump in real sure. fast here. Um, so I hope that this is helping um, our committee members recognize um, the level of diagnostic um, expertise that goes into recognizing which therapy do we apl apply, right? And that um, as you are out in schools and out in the community and you speak to our, our, our advocates of various programs, um, that this provides you a framework around which to have a rich conversation with them. Because as you can see, it's the likelihood of finding a singular silver bullet right. is not uh, feasible, right. right? And that I really want you to have um, a deep and rich understanding so that when you have someone who's like, you know, and everyone needs this and every child needs that, and it's because they're passionate and that was uh, something fantastic for them, that you have, um, again, a framework around which to have a meaningful conversation and uh, to work through the complexity of, of the multitude of therapies that we need to apply, depending upon the unique combination of an individual individual learner. So thank you. I, I'll let I, you go on. No. And, and so to that end, I want to talk a little bit. Last time we talked about um, level literacy intervention, which is the guided reading piece of the intervention. And so that um, I put it on the continuum exactly where it belongs. So level literacy intervention is a piece based on the guided reading framework. Um, and you'll see it's kind of in the middle of the continuum. It is not for students who have a specific deficit in the area of phonics or identify as dyslexic. It is also not for students students who have really strong decoding but have this one specific area of comprehension, which I'm going to come back to in a moment, too. Um, but it is for students who need to put that all together. So guided reading is an approach to guiding readers and putting all of that together. Level literacy intervention is a guided reading approach to intervention for students that are at this point in the continuum. So they have um, weaknesses that are general weaknesses. So they are not for students who have very specific deficits, but more have um, areas of weakness. So maybe their rope is coming together, but the whole thing is a little bit loose, if you will. So they haven't been able to pull it all together in a tight and skillful way. Um, and last time we were together, we talked a little bit about research. And so I did want to share um, the um, Evidence for ESSA is a national clearinghouse that was put together under ESSA during that reauthorization um, where school districts like ours can actually go and look and say, what does the research say? Is there strong evidence? And so level, Fontes and Pinnell's level literacy intervention what, did receive the highest rating of strong based on um, two studies. Here's the critical piece. It has to be with the right readers that match the profile of what they need. It is not a good fit for students with dyslexia. And so we have heard stories in the past where that was the only thing that was offered and my students' needs were not being met, which is part of why our office has worked together for the last several years to really help schools understand those diagnostic pieces and the appropriate match. Um, it's important that we understand that there is a lot of research out there. Sometimes research is slow to make its way in the classroom, but that we as educators use our um, 
background, knowledge, and our experience and expertise to help guide schools towards making those really good decisions of matching the reader with the intervention and approach that's going to be the most beneficial to that student. Um, and so when we talked last time, that other contract that I brought around books, every single one of these use readers. So I wanted to just, for a quick second, while she's pointing that out, I will always encourage my team to bring the materials for you to see because I think seeing is believing, seeing is understanding, and, and it moves things from this abstract um, conversation to something real. You can put your hands on and see what we're talking about. So, so I'm going to pass around just some samplers of level literacy intervention, but again, it's just one piece of a large. Oh, thanks, Jen. I was like, someone's coming. I didn't know who it was. <laughs> um, uh, oh, before go you go on, I just also want to add, um, while we're distributing um, these materials for the committee to look at as examples, um, is that um, when you think about um, our literacy grant, as you know, we are uh, we're fortunate to uh, get a literacy grant, um, and and in applying for that grant, the resources and materials that we um, use in that grant have to be. Um, evidence-based mm -hmm. through SS. So I just wanted to kind of tie that back to um, how we help select the materials and look at what is the evidence um, and that that's a requirement under uh, the federal grants. Um, so that's just one example of um, a program. And I just wanted to circle back because I know that question had come up. Um, it is not for every student, and it is certainly not um, a magic bullet. Another piece of the research that sometimes gets conflated, remember last time I talked about guided reading, capital G, capital R, versus lowercase g and r? Um, Here's what I will tell you is true. When I was in elementary school, the approach for teaching reading at that time was um, I was in the Bluebirds, somebody else was in the Eagles, and we were in those groups for the year. And we were grouped kind of in the beginning of the year, and that was that. Um, research does not support that. Research says that um, guiding readers needs to be flexible and fluid. You need to be constantly monitoring their progress and making adjustments to instruction. You need to use different diagnostic tools. But no matter what the intervention Mentioned, there's a place for books. So even students who are in, because remember we showed before, if we don't also address comprehension, if we don't give students an opportunity to practice what they're learning in connected text, whether it's decodable text or genre-based novels, they will not have the ability to continue strengthening that rope in the area of comprehension. So I wanted to talk a little bit about next steps and what we've been learning. Um, there's two areas that right now are kind of our immediate next steps. Because as I'm sure you can see, we could identify resources on every step along this continuum in every direction to meet the needs of our diverse population of students. One area that we've been particularly focusing on, and we will be coming back in the future to talk about, is this one in the bottom right. It is tricky to think about students who can decode and can't make meaning because as skilled readers, sometimes it's hard for us to understand why don't they just read those words beautifully? Why can't they tell me what they um, learned? And so what we know is there are students, um, many of us use as part of our language comprehension, a strategy called visualization. And we think about making a movie in your mind, if you will. So when you're reading something, oftentimes you are consciously or subconsciously making a movie in your mind to follow that story, to follow that play, or to make meaning of that nonfiction article. There are some students whose film projector, if you will, is broken. And that movie is not playing. And so while they are decoding the words, they are not able to make what we call that gestalt image in their mind. That's a very specific reading area and one that we had not yet addressed. So we've been working with the Office of Special Education to say, this is a very specific population of readers. What can we do? And um, so I just share that by way of a story. And we will be coming back and bringing forward more information about that process and how we work together to identify a resource for a future contract. But I share that process just by way of showing how um, reflective and recursive this is. We look at data, we talk with teachers, we meet with families, and we work together with multiple offices, whether it's the Office of ESOL or Special Education or English Language Arts. So that's one area of need. But here's the other one, and this is going to bring me all the way back full circle, Ms. Mack, to your original request about OpenCourt. 
what we know is that we have far too many students that are showing up as poor decoders. And when you have a whole um, high level of, or a high number of students, say for example in your third grade, when we see park data, um, struggling as readers, you can't intervention your way out of that. You really need to look at your core and think about what is the most solid, effective first instruction that we can give. And so what we know is that while Wonders has a lot of strengths in terms of alignment to standards and resources for teachers, the phonics portion is just not strong enough. It's not explicit enough or systematic enough or recursive enough. Um, it just isn't as strong. And so we set out to figure out, well, what can we do? And all last spring we engaged as outlined in 6002 in what's out there that we can look um, at for phonics. And so that brought us to our open court pilot. And so open court was here years ago. Oh, okay, that was my question. Yes, open court because was I've had here. Teachers tell me yep. that they use their old they open did. court books. <laughs> so what happened was, um, and teachers will always tell it to you straight, right? Um, open court was here years ago. They stopped publishing it. And so it was no longer able to be replenished as we opened new schools, as we added classes, as our population grew. Um, then we purchased Wonders. Many teachers, because teachers know, after year two or three in their classroom, they thought this isn't enough for my kids. And they started to pull out from their closet some of what they had. Um, the good news is open court was republished they have a new version so we were in a position then to say um, and again as part of 6002 let's try it let's see the new version let's see um, what we can do so we selected four elementary schools we wanted to get a range of um, across the county different demographics different um, sizes etc so you'll see the schools listed there all those schools that are piloting it this year are using it in grades K through three, with the exception of White Oak is only using it in K and one. To do that pilot, we engaged in professional learning where we trained all of the teachers as well as the reading specialist stat teachers and administrators. And then we have offered ongoing what we call coaching visits where we follow up and check in in the classroom, um, th looking for things like fidelity, um, how hard or easy are the materials to use, um, what additional supports do you need from us. And so um, I wanted to share notes from the field. Um, oftentimes when we're measuring effectiveness, we look at both qualitative and quantitative data in terms of student but also teacher perception and where our teachers are. Because it's March and we don't have that spring benchmark data yet, um, I wanted to share what we have right now are the qualitative and quantitative data from our teachers. Because oftentimes when I'm here at this table talking with the board, we talk about we need to ask the teachers. We need to talk to them about what they're seeing. Um, and so we did survey our teachers in the pilot, and 100% of them, 20% were in agreed, um, and then 80% were in strongly agreed with the, state, the following statements. The resources and materials in open court have helped to improve my phonics and phonemic awareness instruction. The lessons follow a clear sequence and are easy to follow and use. The materials and resources are appropriate to the goals of the lesson. In addition, I reached out and spoke with two out of the four principals. I haven't connected with the other two yet, but um, I was able to actually visit Elmwood and, and be in a second grade classroom with the administrator there. And we were talking about how um, it has also created consistency of implementation across classrooms because Open Court is much more systematic and explicit and scripted. And so now we have teachers, whether they are a first year teacher or in their 20th year, we have some consistency. Um, and as we illustrated, it's hard teaching reading is um, requiring a lot and so the planning lift um, has been dramatically reduced for our teachers because this is an area where in that 30 to 40 minutes a day as you saw in the components having that systematic explicit what we call structured literacy approach is critically important to that science of reading um, these are some quotes from some of the teachers of things that they shared um, they specifically talk about that support in phonological awareness which is a part that is not as strong um, in currently and they also talked a lot about the recursive nature of the skills um, when I spoke with um, one of the principals today Charlene Banky at Honeygo she also talked about parents and how um, she used to hear more from parents that they thought phonics wasn't rigorous enough that they didn't understand why some of their word callers even needed continued instruction and she said with this because it does have that rigor and they do have that practice and connected text she's not hearing that anymore um, and also talked about specifically 
basically that um, support for teachers, that this has given them that solid foundation. Um, so in terms of us looking forward, um, we are gonna continue to follow that. We have um, coming up later this month and early into April, the next round of those coaching visits. And we'll be coming back with, when we have that spring data, some quantitative student data. Um, and our hope is, um, depending on the budget outcomes, that we will be able to move forward um, with open court as that core support. Um, in addition, as I said, we are moving forward um, and we'll be coming back to talk specifically about a resource needed to address that concept imagery, that population of kids that really that movie maker is broken. Um, and then, of course, we have that ongoing partnership with um, the Office of English Language Arts and Special Education, um, but it also includes the Office of ESOL, Title I. We work really with a, a variety of offices, and then certainly we are always working on continuing that professional learning um, for teachers um, and that curriculum development to support that. What are you using as your baseline against which you will measure your success? Yeah, and so before for, you answer that, I'd like to point out that Mr. Uh, McMillian has not paid a bit of attention because he he's reading about the history of oh. bubblegum. <laughs> oh, <laughs> well, he fa that's what happens when you have engaging text. Bingo. Text, right? Excuse me. <laughs> I thought maybe he was playing with the manipulatives. Yeah, wait, wait. I want to note that chewing gum makes people more alert and proves their memory. Yes, a lot of people do think that when they're taking I'm tests. Sorry, they I want he, has, he has been reading the book while you, you've been you talking. You never have to apologize for I, reading. Right, I think, I think he's just <laughs> demonstrating literacy is not a spectator sport. It's, it's an active and engaged oh, sport. Oh, I didn't... So, but I think that also illustrates the importance of engaging text as part of those intervention programs that, as well. What are you reading about? I, <laughs> <laughs> so she's using her visual literacy and engaging as well. It happened. Imagine a classroom of 28 children. I'm, I'm sure. Yes. Yeah, so so I'm we're, sorry. We're you be, were no, answering no, your question fine. against um, what you're going to measure. The your baseline. Success. What are we going to measure? So there's a couple of things. So um, we will be using winter map to spring map as the two um, pieces because we did not have the fall. Um, we will also be working with Honeygo as an exception, um, looking at past history. So where in some of the schools, like in Franklin and in Elmwood, um, we will try to look at um, growth from second grade, you know, because it's in all the grade levels, what does that look like over time? Honeygo doesn't have last year to compare it to, so because they're a brand new school, so we can't do that. We can at individual students, but those are two places for students. Um, we also will be looking at, I mentioned we had the universal screeners of Dibbles in place in kindergarten and first grade, so we have a variety of tools, but we all, like I said, I cannot underestimate the importance of that teacher level data in terms of their um, ability to plan instruction and also the administrators' feedback on their um, observation and evaluation of those lessons because we know that that instruction is key. So it's really several different factors that we'll be looking at um, to measure success, and um, not the least of which is um, the, the teachers really want it. Um, Charlene went at Banky today um, when we was, had a chance to speak. We'd been uh, we had played phone tag. She said, "I do want you to know that I have visitors in my building that are here really to see the new school, and they talk the most about Open Court." The teachers are like, "Wait a minute, how'd you get that? Is that coming back? We want it." There's a, a real One interest. Of my school visits. Not only did the teacher bring it up um, in a totally different office without the teacher, the principal brought it up. So. so there's definitely, so when we talk about that kind of data, that's a different type of data that we will, um, that are certainly are very mindful of as well. Thank you very much. Sure. If, if you would just, Jeremy, go back to the slide that has the rope on it, just very quickly before we transition to Magnet here. I'll clean up my stuff later. <laughs> uh, so I, um, I want us to just come back to this um, imagery of the rope um, because you're, you will see as we bring forward other presentations both to curriculum committee um, and then as, as resources that we're requesting come forward to contracts and the full board, um, we will refer back to th this and we'll, so that you have, as you are engaging the rest of the board, whether that's in a full board committee, uh, excuse me, a full board, board conversation or contracts committee conversation, um, you have um, some of the framework to, to help your colleagues understand who, who are not here this evening and who may not have the opportunity to uh, see the video um, 
for their benefit as well. So I just want to let you know that as a team, we will come back uh, to this again uh, as a support for you. And I hope that this genuinely helps you understand that when we are bringing forward resources, some of the discernment process that goes into saying, you know, as, as Ms. Shea was saying, we recognize we need to have a better therapeutic support for those students whose projector is, is not quite working. And so we go through an, an extensive process of trying to figure out what is the resources that we have, what is it that uh, is working, is not working, and where do we have gaps in those resources so that you begin to have confidence that we're not bringing forward resources willy-nilly. Mm -hmm. um, and again, as you reach out and talk to advocates, as you reach out and talk to decoding dyslexia folks or um, other community members talk to you, whether that's teachers or principals or parents, uh, you have a tool in your toolbox to uh, engage them in good, meaningful conversation. Uh, I'm a big believer that information is not the same as understanding, and our goal tonight is to help you develop deeper understanding. So, okay, on that, thank you, and I know we're just sure. a little behind our schedule, but not too bad. Um, our next um, presentation that um, we're bringing forward is on our magnet uh, programs. Um, I know that um, you know this is the season that uh, magnet is really a big topic, um, and so again to provide no no worries. See, as a teacher, I I would plan on like okay, everybody pass your books to the end and. We can't let them play with them. Did you take the bubble gum from Mr. McMillian? <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to be responsible for him not hearing. I I was, gonna, I was gonna say, Ms. Mack, you may have a, a job to make sure we have bubble gum for Mr. McMillian <laughs> often. <laughs> I'll pass that. I, I, do, I do have to say that it was um, probably a poor decision to follow Professor Shea. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> but we did bring manipulatives. <laughs> Reading not, material. Not, not as fun. <laughs> So we're here to bring you an overview, as um, uh, Dr. Boswell said, on our uh, magnet programs. Good evening. Um, so just to provide you some context of our magnet programs, currently Baltimore County Public Schools has 32 magnet schools with 116 magnet programs. Let me just take a moment and introduce, this is uh, Ms. Uh, Leanne Schubert. She is our director of, uh, you ha oversee several things, magnet office is just one of which. Right. So I just wanted to take a moment to introduce. Thank you for as director of options for students. Yes. So there's a lot of options that students have in the system and she oversees a number of the programs that deal with those options for students. And magnet okay. is one of those programs. We also have, because you may have a specific quest question related to magnet programs, we do have Mr. Brian Stoll, who's here um, this evening as well, and he's the coordinator of magnet programs. Thank you. I just. Go ahead and proceed. I just want to make sure they knew who was speaking and for what purpose. That's Can you my give fault. those thank numbers you. again, please? Great. I'll start right <laughs> yes, over. Thank you. So in Baltimore County Public Schools, we have 32 magnet schools with 116 magnet programs that serve a very diverse body of students um, from uh, various home schools, various so socioeconomic statuses, and various cultural backgrounds. In Baltimore County, our guiding vision is that magnet programs will assist our students in becoming globally competitive citizens by providing them through our magnet programs unique educational options aligned with our students' interests, their talents, and their abilities. Our magnet programs by definition are programs of study that aren't also available at any of our comprehensive non-magnet schools. So in our system, we have over 16,000 magnet students that represent 14% of our student population in Baltimore County. And through these magnet programs, they benefit from improved student achievement, diverse student enrollment, increased cultural competence of students, increased attendance rates, higher graduation rates, innovative curricula, and specialized teaching staff. So Leanne talked a little bit about this, but we want to make sure we clearly define the purpose of our magnet programs. And they're to provide a viable public school choice option for students, to provide unique educational environments, innovative programs, um, and specialized programs of study or experiences, and to promote student diversity. They're also to provide programming that speaks K to 12 to community needs, 
community interest and what we're seeing from our um, needs in business and in industry as well. So we wanted to talk to you tonight a little bit about what happens at each of the different levels within our schools. So at the elementary level, our magnet programs use an expo exposure model where our youngest learners are exposed to concepts such as computational thinking, science, or international studies through the uh, integration of our existing magnet curriculum with that magnet program. We have four elementary schools with two magnet programs at the elementary level. At the middle school level, our students have an exploration model in our magnet program with multiple pathway options that allow students to move on to high school, whether that's a magnet program or not. Um, and those middle school themes can range from health sciences to performing arts, law, finance, and much more. You actually have brochures in front of you from this school year. That we have 12 middle school magnet schools with 31 magnet programs. And then finally, at the high school level, our magnet programs allow our students to select programs of study with a specific and focus. These high school magnet programs range from automotive service technology to cosmetology to international baccalaureate to sports science to early college high school and so much more. We have 16 magnet high schools with 81 programs. So as you can see on the map on the right-hand side of our um, PowerPoint, our system considers magnet program access using a three-zone model, west and central. Our ultimate and long-term goal with magnet programs is student access to all elementary, middle, and high school magnet programs in each of these three so I'm going to talk a little bit about the application process, um, and we're first going to talk a little bit about events, dates, and how this process works. It's, it's no small undertaking. Um, this displays our 18-19 school year timeline to give you a sense of what that looks like. Uh, multiple, multiple magnet application events are held each fall of the year to inform students and families of the opportunities in our K through 12 magnet programs and how that application process works. Uh, each year we receive thousands of elementary, middle school, and high school applications from thousands of students. And I'm gonna give you those numbers for this year. So in the fall of 2018, this school year, we received 17,540 program applications. And that came from 7,045 students. To put that in context, we could offer 2,737 seats for next school year. There's a significant so, interest in our magnet programs. Right. Give those numbers again, please. <laughs> Absolutely. So uh, this fall, these are this, this fall's numbers for next year, for 1920, we received 17,540 program applications and that came from 7,045 students. I, I wanna make sure we all understand that a student can apply to up to three magnet programs. So that's why those, that's why those numbers look like that. But a okay. student on the Southwest per se cannot apply to Eastern Tech. No, absolutely students can apply to any magnet program at any school. Really? Yes. It, there, there, are, there are transportation constraints but there's not application constraints. So if a parent on the Southwest was willing to drive his or her student every day and pick that student up, that student could indeed apply to Eastern Tech. Yes. Absolutely. Uh, um, Ms. Mack, I can give you some, uh, a great example of that. When I was principal at Patapsco High School, uh, at that time, uh, we were one of the dance programs in the county along with Carver. So we had actually a significant number of students who came to Patapsco High School from the west side. They actually traveled right through the city to come to school over at Patapsco High School for the dance program. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, it's also important to note that all of our programs are available to all of our students. So that includes any student with a disability. So we absolutely provide services for students who may have an IEP or a 504, and we ensure that we provide any of those supports that are necessary. Mm -hmm. 
Could you just go back and also reiterate the number of actual seats available? Because I think that that's a significant um, part of the knowledge I would like our committee members to have so that as they engage parents in the community, uh, because we have such phenomenal interest in our communities around magnet options, you have um, you know a solid sense of proportion of what is actually available seat-wise compared to uh, the volume of interest in application. Absolutely. We offered 2,737 seats for the 1920 school year. Thank you. Mm -hmm. okay, okay, and then each year students are notified of their magnet application status in late winter. Uh, this year elementary and middle school families were notified in, in um, uh, early February and high school families were notified in early March. That date was actually March 8th. A matter of fact, as board members you may in fact have emails related to magnet applications. Uh, so, and, and that's why, because the, that information came out uh, just recently on the 8th of March. At the elementary level, priority placements are given to kindergarten applicants who currently have a sibling residing and attending that particular magnet school. And for both elementary and middle school, magnet placements are ma made using a random lottery. Wait lists are then created for the number of, if the number of applicants exceed the seats that we have at any of our um, elementary or middle schools. A random schools. lottery with no, um, is there no benchmark that a student has to achieve in um, GPA or attendance or? For elementary and middle school, there are no entrance criteria okay. and it's a random lottery, correct. If, uh, keeping in mind that again, at those early grades, it's really about exposure, right? And, and, and the, the challenge around equity with the limited number of seats versus the number of interests as well, so. Um, as Leanne mentioned, especially at elementary, there are only four elementary magnet schools. So it's, it's a very limited number at the elementary. Yeah, I'm just curious, sure. is there any discussion about an uh, elementary magnet on the east side someplace? Absolutely. So yes. as I indicated, we think about our magnet programs using the three zone model, east, west, and central. So it is our end goal to have the same elementary, middle, and high school programs exist in all three areas of the county. So regardless of where a student lives, he or she would have access to those programs. It's well, a long-term goal. <laughs> yeah. Well, in that, let me just, um, it makes me think about, I think the superintendent had shared at a board meeting a few meetings back that, you know, that our magnet programs, when you look back over the history of BCPS, our magnet programs evolved over many decades in a very organic fashion. And so that's part of when I think of your question around, well, we have some things in some areas and not in other areas. And part of the work we're doing is to try to really um, open up that opportunity so that um, we, sh we shouldn't necessarily put families in a situation where they, they live on the west side, but the program that their heart's desires is only offered um, through the tunnel, right? So, um, so that's where the way things have evolved over a long time, and now we're at this place where we're really trying to build these things out so that people have access and it's not um, um, an equal opportunity. So as Mr. Embriali indicated, um, lottery process for elementary and middle schools. However, at the high school level, magnet assessments do occur. The magnet assessments align to the programs of magnet study and vary from program to program and school to school. They may include things like student audition through performance, an essay, an interview, an exam, or a combination of many of those things. The entire magnet application assessment and admission process is guided by the board policy and superintendent's rule 64. At the high school level, we use a three-tiered admission process. So tier one includes priority placement. Tier two includes a random lottery for those students scoring 80% and higher. Tier three, if seats remain to be filled, becomes a random lottery for students scoring at 79%. And then if there are seats left to fill, 78%, et cetera, et cetera, until all of our highly valued magnet seats are filled. Uh, just like at the elementary and middle school level, wait lists are maintained through the end of the first quarter for our magnet programs. Our, our goal is to fill every one of those magnet seats. So we want to take, take, talk a little bit about our MSAP grant because this is significant for the school. Uh, we won this grant back in um, 2017 
uh, we were awarded a $15 million five-year magnet schools assistant program grant from the federal government that established five new magnet schools and programs, and it significantly revised the existing magnet program that was at Overly High School. This grant, now in its second year of implement implementation, has afforded 5,000 students um, at these six schools, incredible opportunities to engage in everything from international studies to health sciences. So this was a significant expansion for us, um, and we're thankful for that federal grant that allowed us to create this expansion. And um, connected to that good news, we want to share some other good news, and that's that uh, this year's National Magnet School Conference is actually here in Baltimore, Maryland. It's April 11th through the 13th, so it's coming up in just a few weeks. Um, and we are the host school district that's associated with that Magnet Conference. Um, and um, over 1,000 conference attendees from all over the country will have an opportunity to actually tour our BCPS Magnet Schools on April 11th and they're going to engage in conference sessions led by magnet leaders from across the country. And I think there's 15 sessions, 15 sessions, 15 sessions that, are, that BCPS teachers and administrators are actually facilitating at the Magnet School Conference. So we're very excited about the opportunity to be the host district for the National Magnet Schools of America Conference. This is quite an honor for the Magnet Schools of America National Association to invite us to be the host school because we have um, recognized magnet programs. And uh, as you saw, you know, our community is very invested and excited uh, about magnet opportunities for our stu students. In fact, I believe one of our committee members might be leading part of those school tours at one of our schools. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I'm, I'm curious on the uh, the test at some of the programs that have uh, that are offered at several different schools. Take for example, culinary mm -hmm. is offered at Sellers Point and Carver that I know of. Anywhere on the west side? Western Tech. Okay, Western Tech. Now, do they all do the same testing process? I know there's actually they make they make a pastry or something at Sollers. Do they do that at all three? You're going to love our new answer to this. If we were in front of you last year, the answer would be each of those individual culinary programs handled their own assessments. This year was the first year where we assessed collectively for all three of those schools. So there was one culinary assessment. It actually was at, uh, we partnered with, Brian, what was the name of the, um, the culinary school that we actually partnered with to hold the assessment? Bradford University. Oh. D down in the city. I think they're near Little Italy. Yes, they are right yeah. in Little Italy. So all of the students have the opportunity to not only take the same exact assessment for all of those programs, whether they applied to one or all three, quite frankly, um, but we had space through Stratford for that to happen for all of our students on the same day in the same space. Mr. McMillian, that we don't, we currently don't do that for all of our high school assessments. We are working towards a more systemic approach to all of our high school assessments. And that's what I was kind of leading to with the dance piece, because dance, you know, that evaluation would be so objective. And I don't know if more objective than a pastry, you know. <laughs> so but. dance we have also standardized at this process uh, at this point, meaning that it is the same dance assessment using adjudicators from all of the schools that have a dance program, Patapsco, Carver and Milford Mill. So we have adjudicators present from all three of those schools at all of the assessments. Um, we're looking for a space that can accommodate all of the dancers on one day in one location with transportation provided, but we did standardize that assessment as well. And I don't know whether I should, well, I'm going to say it, but uh, you know, we, we've had an oral argument that was presented to us about the dance. And about how the. I don't think we should yeah, say it. I, no? I would, I okay. I would just caution yeah, you. I don't think. I certainly don't want to tell board members what to do, but I would just caution you because these things are in closed session right. for a, a reason because you're, that's when you are serving your quasi judicial uh, mm -hmm. role. I think Margaret Ann would be proud of me. Um, <laughs> uh, I, I don't know if that was, but that's why that's in closed session. So, um, but I think you're questioning around what is our process? How how equitable? How consistent? Um, are all appropriate? And the role of the educators? 
Is that the? The evaluators. Yeah. So, so in, in most of our assessments, our, our own educators here in Baltimore County are the assessors. That, that was a, that's especially the case when those assessments are occurring at individual schools. We're, we're looking at how that process looks collectively, but these are our programs, so we do want our teachers as part of that assessment process. Okay, and I have a couple other questions and then I'll pass this on. Stemmers Run's going to become an international baccalaureate middle school this year? Stemmers Run. They're going through the process. That is correct. A very that's, intense process. Yeah, and if yeah. that's cleared or whatever, so they'll be the only middle school in Baltimore County Public Schools that is a international baccalaureate program? They have their, they have their visit coming up real so, soon. Uh, early Stemmers April, Run, I think. Yeah, Stemmers Run is currently in an international study. They're in application process for a middle years program international baccalaureate status. Um, they will, I'll say knock on wood, when they get that certification, right, they would be our first uh, middle school with the middle years international baccalaureate program. Um, but we also have, actually through the grant that Mr. Imbriali mentioned, Middle River Middle School is pursuing that on the east side as well as Windsor Mill Middle School on the west side. So they're right behind Stemmers in the process. So with Stemmers Run, all the children that are zoned to, for that school will be somehow involved in that international baccalaureate, and then they'll accept magnet students and from other areas to that fill their correct. seats. That is exactly. correct. Exactly. It is a full school magnet program and that aligns um, for those students to then matriculate to Kenwood um, as well. Yeah. Now, I, I, I'm fairly per, uh, familiar with Kenwood's, you know, the International Baccalaureate Diploma coming from, still it comes from Sweden or somewhere. Is that where that diploma? The Hague I mean, is my understanding. What's that? The Hague is my understanding. Hague. No. Oh, okay. And then lastly, I noticed that the, the sports science academies are at Kenwood and Western Tech. At one time, was that at Milford? And they've moved it from Milford? No, it's always been at Western Tech? It, it started in 93 at Kenwood, and only a couple of years ago, we introduced the program on the west side at, at Western. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. I don't have any questions. Um, I have a comment. Uh, my, I have three daughters, two of whom went to Sudbrook Magnet Middle, and all three of whom went to Western Tech. And I'd like to share the story that when my daughter went to college on a full ride, one of her professors said to her, honey, I don't know where you went to school, but you are one of the best math science prepared children, we, uh, students that we have ever had. So I think that is a testament to our magnet programs. And I wish more children had that same type of access because um, Western Tech, you know, has been integral to my children's success in life. I just thought of something else. If the Stemmers Run community wants to take advantage of that, is the fact that that hasn't been approved or officially cleared, how will that affect the, the magnet process? So Stemmers has been in place as a, as a magnet school for the last two school years. So that means as they are in application status for international baccalaureate, we have to demonstrate to the IB that we have all these processes in place. So that program of study with that international mindedness has been in place. Mm -hmm. um, the magnet status has allowed Stemmers Run to draw in applicants outside of that attendance boundary to also access that program of study as long with, along with all of the students who are zoned to attend Stemmers Run. Okay, so if someone, you know, if a parent wanted to put their child into that program, but the program hasn't been, you know, cleared for implementation, how would that affect the, the timing of the magnet application? Is it too late for those people? Because I, I understand the question. The, the magnet application, it, it, it's currently called, what, what are we? International Studies. International Studies. Until it officially is stamped an IB school, it has to, we have to refer to it as an international studies school. As soon as that school is IB stamped, which we believe is going to happen in weeks, then that school, I heard that somewhere, <laughs> uh, that school becomes an IB magnet school. Okay, so if a parent didn't apply to the international piece, then it's gonna to be too late to get that child into the program for, for uh, sixth grade next year, this coming fall? 
No, so students who applied this past fall applied to the international study. The gift with purchase, as our superintendent would say, is uh, when STEMers, when and if STEMers gets the certification, they will automatically be a part of the international baccalaureate. Okay, so it would be too late for somebody to specifically apply for the international baccalaureate. For 1920, yes, yes. that is that is that Thank is you. the case. But all students who are currently zoned to attend that school are in will be in that IB program if they are approved. And then there maybe even could be a special permission in a case, maybe, if somebody pursued that angle? No, because they're, they're whole school magnet programs, the only way to access that program if it's not your zone school is through the magnet application process. Thank you. Okay, so I, I hope that that, again, gives you a background for as you engage with community members and anything else that uh, you experience in the other aspects of your work as a board member. Um, and that, that gives you, again, some information, understanding, and framework for um, engaging in your role. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. At this point, we're going to um, move on to um, bringing forward some instructional materials um, for your review and approval. Um, and oh, I'm yes. Oh, yes. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Ms. Mack. Um, yes, yeah, so we just want to, for the record, um, acknowledge that we are adjusting our May curriculum committee date. It will, the new date will be May 15th at our normal 4.30 to 6 o'clock in the afternoon time frame, and we'll be posting uh, the new um, date on the the board's website uh, for committees, and we just wanted to uh, announce that well in advance so everyone could adjust schedules as, a, as needed. Thank you. And then moving on to instructional materials for approval, um, Ms. Shea is in place, um, and uh, we're gonna look at um, an exciting, oh, I forgot I to bring. know. <laughs> so Dr. McComas and I were going to bring yesterday, um, if you, I think you all were at the State of the Schools, you may remember our beautiful centerpieces, the boxes with the cutouts. Okay, so they were made by the material that we're going to be talking about today. So we were going to bring it as a reminder, a visual reminder of what in exactly my car. we're talking about. Um, so good afternoon again. I'm here on behalf of the Office of Career and Technology Education to talk about an upcoming um, contract for supplies and equipment. This is specific to laser engravers. So um, laser engravers are used in a variety of our CTE programs of study, including but not limited to the majority of use is in um, project lead the way programming and in construction design management. Um, so in the course of those um, programs, students use rapid prototyping um, and are asked to solve design challenges. And so a laser engraver may be one tool or equipment that they use as part of that. So for example, um, students were asked at Hereford in, in that program to design the centerpieces that you saw yesterday. Um, and um, I will show you a few more examples of some of the projects. Um, but the um, contract will be coming up and it will provide for the equipment materials and then the um, associated training. Um, the purchase of these uh, laser engravers is funded by the Perkins grant. So just to give you, um, we had one example was yesterday at the State of the Schools. Um, here's another example of some of the authentic projects. So in our elementary science curriculum, when we transitioned to the NGSS, um, we created a new unit around launching rockets. And so our CTE students um, actually solved the design challenge of creating the um, clinometers, I believe is how you pronounce that, um, which is how you measure the altitude of the rockets as part of that curriculum. So rather than um, purchasing it somewhere else, are, they are CTE made is our um, hashtag for branding for our students. So that became a part of their design challenge to connect to the curriculum that our elementary students used. Um, we also had students create, um, recently we had um, students from many of our high schools participate in the Model United Nations. And so our CTE students um, engaged in rapid prototyping to solve a design challenge around the placards recognizing the country. So you'll see down at the bottom of that placard, um, they were essentially holding the placards in place. And then on the right hand side, you can see an authentic project. We've talked a lot about our student run help desk. So our CTE students used laser engravers to create their name tag. Um, so that's just a sampling of the program, but the curriculum and both Project Lead the Way and Construction Design Management uses laser engravers for a variety of um, curriculum related uh, programs. The laser engravers, this contract will provide for the purchase of the laser engraver um, equipment 
as well as the associated ventilation um, system. And then in future, there may be a need to have replacement lenses or um, for example, um, something called a rotary fixture that if they were going to try to engrave on glass um, is like an additional, if you think, I, I likened it to, um, Dr. Grubbs is gonna cringe somewhere, but it's like an attachment on my KitchenAid mixer, like you can change it out. <laughs> that's not what he would say, but that's how I understood that um, they may have this additional rotary fixture if they were gonna be laser engraving on glass. So that will be an upcoming contract. Where will these, what schools? Yes, so. Um, we have Project Lead the Way. Currently, we have laser engravers at Hereford High School, Patapsco, Western Tech, and Dundalk. Um, this, um, this year, we were able to purchase um, laser engravers that went to Catonsville High School for their Project Lead the Way, and just last week delivered one at Pikesville High School for their Project Lead the Way. This contract will allow us to do our purchases um, right away at Owings Mills High School for their Project Lead the Way, for Sparrows Point High School as part of their construction design management program, and for Delaney High School as part of their Project Lead the Way. And then in um, fiscal year 20, we would be expanding to Parkville High School school for Project Lead the Way at Franklin High School for Construction Design Management, and then the following school year at Woodlawn High School as part of the Project Lead the Way, and Chesapeake High School for Project Lead the Way as well. Thank you. Sure. Yes, ma'am. So I know Lansdowne has a Project Lead the Way for biomedical. Do they have one for mechanics or what this would be needed I for? I do not believe, I'll double check my list, but I don't believe Lansdowne has the Project Lead the Way Engineering, okay. which is the one this is programmed. I think Thank you're correct. You. I'm double checking my list. Nope, they are not for engineering, just this part. Yep. Any questions about that? So this, again, will be coming as an upcoming um, contract. And I think I mentioned it's funded with Perkins grant funds. Uh, Perkins is the federal grant to support CTE specifically. Okay. I made up oh, for some of my time. So I, I, um, I do ask that we need to have a vote. <laughs> do you approve that as, a, as an instructional resource? Okay, thank you. And, and <laughs> Ms. Cox, you have the, the vote count. Um, thank okay, you. thank you. We do appreciate it. And our project engineering, you know, our project lead the way engineering students really appreciate it. Okay, so coming um, up to the table, we have Dr. Wisted and Ms. Ryder, and forgive me, I cannot remember our BCBA. Kelly Evans. Thank you, Kelly. Um, um, so coming forward um, in future uh, board uh, contracts and full board uh, meetings, you will see a contract coming forward for um, our board certified behavior analyst, which is a most beloved um, request uh, of errors in the community. And at that, I'll turn it over to the experts to speak more in detail. Sure. Um, as you stated, Ms. Ryder, our Director of Special Education, is here, and Ms. Evans, who is a board certified behavior analyst, to share with you what they do, um, the science behind it, uh, and a little overview about it. You may have heard uh, CCAC, one of the uh, groups, the parent advisory groups, talk about uh, putting BCBAs in the operating budget, so that is also a request. This contract is about using contractual funds um, for BCBA services, so it's not exactly an instructional material, but we wanted to educate you on what a BCBA is and what they do. Thank you. So what is a BCBA? Um, we use a lot of acronyms in the Office of Special Education, so we're going to do our best to try to um, inform you of what exactly is a BCBA. So a BCBA basically is a person um, who has a level of certification in what is called Applied Behavioral Analysis. So the other acronym that you might hear us refer to is ABA, and I think that comes up a lot through our CCAC meetings and a lot of your conversations with um, the communities. So behavior analysts, they can work in schools, classrooms, Rooms. They've worked in hospitals, they've worked in clinics, in nonprofits, in nonpublics, and they specialize in behavior. Um, a lot of BCPAs, too, also specialize in specific type of disabilities. Um, autism is one of which, um, multiple disabilities, developmental delay, and also students who have some mental health issues. Um, BCPAs do have a certification in applied behavioral analysis. And ABA basically uses the scientific 
and the systematic processes to help influence an individual's behavior. And behavior analysis is the study of how people are acting, how they're interacting, and how they're socializing and behaving in social settings. So that's kind of like the, the meaning of, of ABA. BCBAs, though, they do collaborate with staff in the school buildings. We do have a lot of experts already in our schools, such as the school psychologists, special education teachers, administrators, general education teachers. It is the role of the BCBA to support school-based staff um, in addressing the behavioral needs of students. Many of the BCBAs do conduct observations and help to design behavior intervention plans and therapy plans for, for students in our classrooms. There are two pathways, just to kind of give you a little bit of background in how someone can become a BCBA. Um, they are, again, certified in applied behavior analysis, and it's a graduate level distinction. So one way is to receive a master's degree in applied behavioral analysis, education, or psychology. They also have to undergo 1,500 hours of supervised experience and pass the BCBA exam. So that's one um, avenue in which you can become a BCBA. The other is to receive a doctoral degree in ABA, education, or psychology, 10 years post-doctoral experience practicing ABA, and to pass the BCBA exam. So as you can see, it's this, um, there's a lot of um, studies that, of which they have to undergo in order for them to even receive that level of certification. And that is something that we've really sought for many years to have here in Baltimore County as full-time employees. Um, prior to about three, three years ago, um, Kelly was our first BCBA. Mm -hmm. We're very excited to have her. We did have to um, work a lot with more contractual providers. Um, so we had a lot of contractual costs around BCBAs. And in some cases, we, weren't, we wouldn't be able to support the needs of our students, and they would have to receive their services in a more more restrictive environments, such as a non-public school. So we, a lot of times we work with our non-public schools to look at the type of services that they're providing there and how can we provide or replicate comparable services here within BCBS to support our students in the least restrictive environment. So we did um, advocate for that about three years ago. We received well, our first BCBA um, and then through, um, thank you so much to the, to the previous board and this board for uh, continually approving the um, additional request for staffing. We do have, as you'll see later on, six BCBAs working with us in Baltimore County Public Schools, and the contract will allow us to work with um, continued contractual providers to ensure that we're providing services to students. Can I ask a quick question? Why is this presented um, from the special education perspective? Do BCPAs only work with special education behavioral students or all students? Um, they work primarily with students who have mostly, uh, mostly intensive needs. Many of our students that we currently work with do have IEPs, but as you'll see, we also do work with um, students who do not have IEPs as okay. well. Thank mm -hmm. you. I guess like. Mm -hmm. oh, that's okay. <laughs> that's fine. Can, so, go ahead. Yeah. Sure. Can I? I've noticed a couple times you've mentioned contractual mm -hmm. uh, services. Is, is that because the system doesn't have enough of these people, so then we have to go outside the system and actually hire you know, a service to come in and provide this? Sure. So it's uh, what it, one of two ways. Um, when we, it's very similar to such as like a related service provider. In some cases, if a, a service provider is identified on a student's IEP, then we are legally obligated to provide that level of service. Um, we do have some students who have that direct service on their IEP. So we want to make sure that we're not missing that service ever. Um, because we do have six um, BCBAs, we do have over 15,000 students with um, IEPs. We have about 12% of our population with autism. Yes, we do need to make sure that we have enough staff to support. Um, so there have been cases where we've had to go outside um, to make sure that we're continually providing that level of service. For example, we did have one of our BCBAs who was out for a paternity leave um, and welcomed the new baby girl, and we wanted to make sure that we were able to access services while he was not and available. And our BCBA services um, that are provided by contractors able to be billed back to Medicaid? The ones that we have do not. No. Have to know. Mm -hmm. okay. And mm -hmm. how do the contractor cost of BCBAs compared to the loaded labor rate of a full-time Baltimore County employee? It typically cost, it would cost more um, for a contractual BCBA than one that would be a full-time um, FTE with employment. Even Baltimore with County. the benefits and all of that factored in. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. And, and oh. That's okay. Sure. I'm sorry. Go ahead. 
I think one of the things we have to consider when we're thinking about full-time FTEs versus contractual services is the county government is also on the books for that person's employment and their retirement. Mm -hmm. So if you're adding an FTE, it's not only Bernard's 30 years, 30 years in the system, mm -hmm. it's then my 30 plus years of retirement. No, and that's why, I mean, I always refer to that, we refer to that in my world as loaded labor rate. So um, I'm sorry, I should have made that clear. Thank you, sorry about that. That, that included the, ex the cost of that employee through the life cycle of that employee. Let me, let me just also add, um, just for the conversation, is that um, as Ms. Ryder has indicated, we have, over the last several years, we have been requesting VCBAs. We will continue to request them. Um, and so that we are building our own FTE inventory. And then I just also would like to add, um, but as you said, you know, the, the budget process is a process, right? Um, and much goes in and what comes out comes out. Um, and, and we do the very best we have we can with what we have and then we need there are times when we need to supplement with contracting um, and then I would also like to add that part of that as you know we have students that enter our system throughout the school year that may swell the the need and that's another example of where the need to be able to contract for supplemental it's um, you know if we could wave our wand and have a, a cadre of VCBAs, we certainly would, but we recognize. So is this contract that we're, that's going to be coming to us to complement our pool of contractors? Well, I'll, I'll let okay, them I'm discuss. Sorry. That's okay. <laughs> sure. So the, um, the contract would allow for um, approved vendors to provide um, direct consultation and services for students um, who have that level identified on their IP. And I think there's a few times throughout this presentation we'll talk about how we currently utilize our BCBAs and how we would also complement that with potential contractual services. Thank you. So again, what is um, BCBA? BCBAs are certified in applied behavioral analysis, and behavioral analysis basically helps us to understand how does behavior work? Um, how is behavior infected by the environment? How is learning taking place? And it's built upon um, certain principles, one of which is that behavior is largely a product of, of its environment, and behavior is either strengthened or can be weakened based upon what happens immediately following the child's um, moment or incident or, or behavior. And it also is built upon the principle that children or students respond better to positive types of consequences that um, last for longer. And also, if a behavior increases, then in some way it's almost being um, and reinforced. Mm -hmm. So a lot of it is helping, just as Megan Shea talked about how we have to address the academics, and we use all these a variety of tools to kind of assess where a child is w with his or her reading skills. We apply that same type of strategy and skill when we're looking at behavior. We have to use a lot of different diagnostic tools. Um, we um, also, in addition to like the observational types of tools to really figure out um, where do we see the problematic behaviors and how do we then design, like you word for reading, a reading plan, how do we design a behavior intervention plan that is really looking at those antecedents and addressing those functions of behavior. It's the same type of process that we would use for behavior as that we do academics. And overall, the basic um, principle of ABA is understanding that behavior really it serves a function and it really is a way in which a child or a student is communicating his or her needs. So often one of the first things we do is to identify the function of the behavior or the why that's behind a problematic behavior that we may be seeing. Um, there are four functions of behavior. So one is attention, meaning that you're seeking some kind of social interaction. One may be escape, meaning avoiding something that's non-preferred, either a social interaction or a task or an environment. Um, we also have the tangible function, which is really an item or an activity that the person is seeking. So you may have seen this in the grocery store when a child may have a tantrum <laughs> for a candy bar. You know, give me the candy and mom says no and then they cry and mom gives them the candy. We would say that's maintained by a tangible function. It's working out for them. Right? <laughs> and, then, and then we have um, automatic reinforcement or sensory, which it means there's some kind of internal process that feels good to the person when they demonstrate this behavior, that there's some kind of release from that. So as BCBAs, we do have six BCBAs. Um, we really focus on providing IEP services. We also provide some indirect services. 
and we really love to focus on professional learning to build capacity in staff. So what does that look like? I, as, as individual schools plan their IEP meetings um, and behavior is one of the components or it, it's on the child's IEP, the six of you and then the contracted staff are, the coordination is that you will be going from school to school. Is that how it, what it looks like on a daily basis? We do go to many schools. It's been okay. a lot of time driving. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, we schedule it in the same area. No, right, I, right. I, I'm sure. But w between the six of you and the contractors, mm -hmm. they fill the meetings that are taking place for children with IEPs or if you're providing, I guess, developmental assistance to teachers in a school where there are behavioral issues. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Right. Right, right. It's more than just the IEP team meeting. They are in, the, you know, doing observations. They're coaching the teacher. They're providing professional learning, maybe to the entire staff on things. So it, it's and more. And would than you just provide me. new teachers with classroom management coaching, or that's not in your purview? We do help with that. Um, I recently participated in a panel for new teacher orientation. Um, so we provided some strategies that way. We also do provide some professional learning during New Teacher Orientation Week as well to oh, discuss okay. some classroom mm -hmm. management strategies. Kelly also last year was a part of our professional learning that we did with principals about the functions of behavior. So uh, again, touching more than just special education, just giving that background. Thank you. So as part of the IEP service, we do help um, design, data collection, systems, analyzing the data, and looking at progress. Um, we also support the schools in developing functional behavioral assessments and behavior intervention plans. That way we can choose really effective interve interventions based on the student's behavior and the why behind that behavior. Um, we've had a lot of success with the students that we have been working with on IEP services. There was a student who I was working with who had some pretty disruptive behaviors. And as part of the team process, we decided to add a BCBA consult to the supplementary aids and services. And that involved, I provided specialized training to the staff working with him. I also came into the school. I modeled some of those interventions. And then I observed them and provided some feedback and coaching. Um, and now that student is, I actually was just at a school a couple weeks ago, doing very well in his general education class, not just academically, because he is a rock star academically, but also socially and behaviorally. He's really functioning very well. Yes, thank you. I want to, will you repeat your name, please? Kelly Evans. Oh, oh well, it's not <coughs> hard. Gee. Okay, as uh, Ms. Evans just pointed out, I, I wanted a, a few comments ago to just go back to that because I think what she said is critical as she spoke about the amount of time driving and that they try to schedule mm -hmm. by area. Mm -hmm. And I, I want us to process really what she's saying in terms of the school and um, the children and behavioral needs mm -hmm. because that is a problem and why it's important to have more because in setting up teams and other interventions, you have to fit it in, put a child on hold or figure out what you do with that child and the situation within the school to fit into the schedule because there are a lot of needs even beyond the IEP. We've, you've focused on the IEP, but very often it, it surpasses that because it's not always the child with the IEP um, about whom we are concerned. And then when parents have said to us and, and, and teachers have asked why we don't get on things when we mm -hmm. start to see a problem. Yep. Again, it's because we don't have that kind of staffing to come in and do the interventions and to do the assessments early on. So then we end up pretty much waiting until now it's at 
almost critical Absolutely. mass, and, and that's why this is critical. Absolutely, we 100% agree with you, and we also um, look at this in regards to how much Shea spoke to reading before. It's not one size fits all. Not everybody needs the BCBA. I think it's kind of like the OG. Everybody, you know, OG, OG, BCBA, Best BCBA. Ever. That's the next thing we also hear. And what we really want to look at is that whole multi-tiered systems of support. And for some students, um, their needs can be very um, met very well um, by just a school-based staff and team. We also have experts within each of the schoolhouse, such as the school psychologists. In some cases, some schools have the school so work social workers. We have some fabulous special education teachers, too. So we really try to utilize the supports and services of our BCBAs, not only just for the individual student needs or those who might have more of intensive behaviors, but also to build the capacity of our school-based teams, because really they're the ones every day who have to implement the behavior intervention plans and respond to the, to the students. So it's really building the school-based team um, is how we mostly utilize the services of our BCBAs. So speaking about how much we drive, <laughs> we've, um, among the six BCBAs, we've supported 183 individual students, um, and that is in 104 different schools that have been supported, and 730 school visits. Um, those, we try to, as much as possible, have proactive observations and consultations, uh, especially with our regional uh, learning programs. We provide additional support to them more proactively, scheduled site visits, monthly or bimonthly. Um, we also provide responsive observation and consultation when a school requests it. So those are the indirect services. Um, some other indirect services just highlights um, and how we've utilized the resources of our BCBAs. And again, growing and building the capacity of our school-based um, administrators and IEP teams and educational teams. One of which is we do have um, verbal behavioral learning programs here within Baltimore County Public Schools. They are currently um, at two of our separate public day schools. And um, Dr. Whitstead was actually the former principal of, of one of our schools. So this um, type of learning program is for students who whose needs previously could not be met within um, Baltimore County. There are students with autism and who also have significant learning needs. And I'm very excited that we were able now to provide this level of supports and services to our students and their families here within BCPS who, who couldn't access it before. These programs are highly structured in their learning framework and they really have an emphasis on verbal behavior and it just breaks down all of the skills into um, component parts and there's a lot of um, additional supports and services that are provided by our BCBAs and building the capacity of the um, special education teachers, the related service providers, the paraeducators, and the additional adult support staff. So there's a lot of direct training for all of the um, teachers and support staff who would, would work with the students within these buildings. We've also um, utilized a lot of our BCBA support to provide support to our separate public day schools. We do have, in addition to White Oak, we have Main Choice, Battle Monument, and Ridge Ruxton. And um, students are receiving services at these schools when it's deemed by the IEP team that they need a, a more intensive level of support and services. And we're really excited to be able to have one of our BCBAs who provides a consistent level of support and service to those three schools and helping the teachers and the administrators and the behavioral support staff that they have in those buildings to build their capacity in meeting the needs of all students. Um, and then they're also um, really tying in and kind of marrying the worlds together of the educational world and kind of the clinical behavior world and how do we really design effective overall learning programs for students because it's not just coming in with the behavior plan, it really has to be uh, melded in and integrated with the educational plan too. The regional support model, so this is also where we've um, provided a level of support for our students who are receiving their services in more of our regional self-contained type of special education programs. We've also um, made sure that we're having our BCBAs provide proactive professional learning, going out consistently and providing that level of coaching. And we also have provided a lot of professional learning and face-to-face -face professional learning and online modules. And the number that we're gonna give you for this one is we're very excited. Um, we've provided training to over 361 teachers and paraeducators um, and having them understand what the principles of ABA are and how they could apply that to their classroom teachers and working with students. 
So with that, um, again, it's not only how do we utilize this expertise of the BCBAs and working directly with students through the IEP team process, but then how do we take this expertise that they have to build the capacity of as many teachers that we have as possible, inclusive of general education teachers, special education teachers, and our support staff, so that way we can build their capacity and best meeting the needs of students in our schools. So we have really kind of have a very differentiated um, support model for professional learning within our office. We provide countywide training. We also provide focused professional training for professional learning cohorts, groups of teachers. And then we have also have a customized training model as well. So for our countywide training, it's how do we take this and get to as many teachers as possible um, by providing that level of support and service. So we do offer Introduction to Applied Behavior Analysis classes, and they are quite popular, and we have some going right now, and they're filling up fast. Um, so with this, we offer not only um, to special education teachers, but also to general education teachers. And we have actually had a lot of general education teachers who have signed up to take this um, series of cohorts that is t being taught currently by our BCBAs. So there's a lot of workshops that our general education teachers can um, participate in. And then we also, again, have maximized our resources by having our BCBAs participate in our once monthly mandatory IP chairperson training meetings. And at those chairperson training meetings, we also have special education teachers. Um, and at the elementary level, it's the assistant principal. They do come to um, those meetings. And we've been providing once monthly um, professional learning um, in a series with those staff facilitated by our BCBAs. And I, what I love is not only looking at just the numbers of like how many teachers have we trained, but really kind of seeing the results in the classrooms and then also hearing the feedback that we get from the teachers. And I won't read this to you, um, but I think the one st sentence that a special education teacher at um, Sandy Plains mentioned, she said, I've ch now changed the way that I both view student behavior and I've also changed the way that I teach. And I feel like a, a statement like that is just powerful to us because they're really um, not only making changes in their instruction, um, but they're really aligning it to meet the needs of our students. So in terms of the focus professional learning, we have had a cohort for regional or yeah, self-contained regional program teachers, paraeducators, as well as some identified staff members as well. We provide face-to-face -face learning for those staff. For about, it's usually about two and a half hours. We have between five and seven sessions, depending on the need. And then we also have online learning modules that they complete to also reinforce that knowledge. Um, following that, we provide on-site coaching and collaboration to help with the actual implementation within the classroom. And then customizing it, um, a lot of what research shows us is not what just happens in those face-to-face -face type of professional learning opportunities, but how are we supporting teachers in the implementation of what they learn. Sometimes it's very different to hear um, that information shared with you in that type of workshop, but how do you go back and bring it to life inside the classroom when you actually have the students in front of you? So we really try to utilize our BCBAs to work proactively and provide that additional coaching by going around to the different schools and I think Kelly can give an example or two what that looks like um, in the proactive coaching model. So typically for the staff that we are providing coaching for, we will go in and observe. We'll collect data, so we'll have our baseline data. Um, that helps us identify areas for coaching where the needs are based on students as well as teaching style. Um, that also helps us later on to see how effective we've been in changing the behavior. Um, then we'll go in when we've talked with the administration and also the teacher about what kind of our plan is, we will model some of those strategies. We'll come back, we'll observe, talk through it. We do a lot of collaboration and some problem solving. And then we provide feedback, maybe some more coaching and modeling again. And then we look at our data and see how we're doing. And then is there another need that we can address or have we done a great job? And then we just kind of do maintenance checks following that. BCBAs spread equally across elementary, middle, and high school, or it do, it, is there more need in one or the other? Mm -hmm. It is our goal to have that equally distributed. I think sometimes we see more of the request support coming to us for um, at the elementary level is usually where we see more of the request for support coming to us. Okay, mm -hmm. thank you. Mm -hmm. 
and I won't read all this last quote to you again, but it's kind of like the power of the words that teachers are saying where you really know that it's working. But for her, she just talked about how the ABA coaching has helped me to better understand the difficult behaviors of students and how to shape the behaviors through positive interventions and proactive approaches as opposed to negative interactions with students. This has led to better relationships with students and an increase of positive interactions, which in turn has led to increased academic time and improved grades and test scores. So what we really like and the feedback that we've been getting from a lot of the principals and also the teachers is that they're able to really apply the skills that they've learned and, and not only are they seeing it just in the improvement and pro-socially um, proactive better um, just the behavior but also they're seeing it in the academics as well um, so they're really seeing positive overall climate and academic change in addition to the behavioral changes that they're seeing and that is all. I'm curious what are we doing as a system to do we have any university college cohort relationships to promote you know uh, the certification from our current classroom teachers I'm not aware of that for BCBAs specifically we are doing that with special education um, but I'm not aware of one for BCBAs and Miss Evans were you a classroom teacher at one time and then you pursued this I worked in non-public schools for 16 years, and I had potentially every role you can have in a school. <laughs> I started as a one-to-one. -one. I was an assistant teacher. I was a long-term substitute. I realized that I wasn't a big fan of lesson plans, and I went into psychology. Um, so I was, uh, yeah, counseling. I did counseling, and then um, I was in administration in the area of behavior and pursued my BCBA. And who would, if, if there's a need for these positions in our system mm -hmm. and we're contracting outside the system, mm -hmm. it would seem to me that, you know, if we could develop some sort of relationship with a, you know, we talk about these cohorts all the time through co buildings and contracts. Mm -hmm. If we could talk to somebody about, you know, a local university about focusing on this for us. Hi, Mr. McMillan. I wanted to speak to this just because I attended the Assistant State Superintendent for Curriculum Instruction meeting for Dr. McComas last week. And so one of the challenges we have is that this certification isn't recognized as a certification within education. And so without that, th those certifications that MSDE lists are often the ones that universities then prime themselves to produce. And Ms. Evans and I work together in non-public, and one of the things that makes it easier to get a BCBA certification is that, for example, the non-public we worked at is affiliated with Johns Hopkins Hospital, and so you have a clinical environment that is a part and um, a part and annex to the school program. And so you need lots of clinical supervision and that's afforded to you and available to you as an employee there. So that made it a little bit different. I would assume I heard other chief academic officers asking MSDE to add BCBA certification as a recognized um, certification for staff because in other school districts, their challenge is not only not able, not being able to find qualified individuals, but other school districts were able to share with me that because of their bargaining unit agreements, they cannot put the BCBAs in the administrative or the teacher bargaining unit. So then those staff are coming in in their systems in the paraprofessional bargaining unit. So they can't actually afford to pay them what they're actually worth in terms of their professional knowledge and expertise. Mm -hmm. So while we do need more BCBAs, we are uniquely positioned as a school system with um, the bargaining unit structure that allows us if the county then agrees to give us those positions and then people like um, all of us who are, we're all special educators actually um, who've had rich experience working with these staff and understand the need for them so the BCBAs are um, are Tabco or case their case in our okay. school system okay. yes ma'am thank you uh, okay, so I, I know our time is um, ticking here. We're a little over schedule. So um, we do ask that we have a vote, um, that you understand why, what the purpose of BCBAs are. And while we do have some in our organization and continue to request them through the budget process, there is a, also a need at this point to contract for supplemental uh, service as well. And so if, if we could have a vote. All in favor. Thank you. And Ms. Cox, you have that. And then last but not least, and I know um, our time is very short, um, so Dr. Adams, if you could um, bring forward our next um, resource here. 
Yes, um, so I am bringing forward a resource to support our student athletic program. Um, and again, the Department of Athletics reports to my department as a part of the Division of Curriculum and Instruction. And Mr. McMillian, you will be very familiar with this. So one of the things that needs to happen is we need to register students um, in order for them to participate in the interscholastic athletics program. Um, Jeremy, I'm not getting click action here. Thank you. Um, so just as a reminder, we have 21 sports at the high school level and over 10,000 students participate every year. And so just before you, I have those sports listed by the season, the fall sport. The fall season is our heaviest season with the most sports. And then winter, there are fewer. And then spring, we have a bit more. Um, just for those who have not been athletic directors or you may not have had um, students who or children who participated in the interscholastic, interscholastic program, um, you have to be under 18 by August 31. You have to have a GPA greater than or equal to 2.0 and included in your GPA, you can only have what we call one bad grade for lack of a better word. You can have one failing grade, one medical grade or one incomplete. Um, you of course need parent permission and why, while I'm, why I'm here before you this evening is you have, there are a lot of forms you have to complete in order to participate in the athletic program. And so um, many, not too many years ago, but years ago, all these forms were paper and pencil. And so there was a lot of manual um, entry for parents, for students, for athletic directors, for coaches, and then those cycles repeated for every season. So students who participated in athletics and were three sport students needed to complete this process multiple times over the school year. And this is a list of all the, I won't read them to you, but this is a list of all the forms that students and or their parents need to complete. And so we went through, um, an RFP process in the Office of Athletics um, using our stakeholders and have identified an electronic registration system for our students and their parents to be able to use. Um, the name of that system is called Form Relief. We have been using it since 2016, and the reason we went through the RFP process is because we anticipated um, up through last year, the annual costs were under that $25,000 threshold that requires board permission and authority to procure, and we are anticipating because each year we have more students enrolled, um, each year we have more, therefore more students participating in our athletics program, we were concerned that the procurement costs would hit that $25,000 threshold and we wanted to be within our procedures and policies. And so we thought it best to go through a process to look at everything out there and then um, arrive at a decision um, around a product. And we landed, the stakeholder group landed on the product which, with which our students and our parents have lots of familiarity and actually they love it. And um, we get lots of positive feedback about this uh, product. So. As, a, as someone with a performance management background, I appreciate the fact that this is going to increase efficiencies. Um, we can report and monitor funding and eligibility. Um, an athletic director can run reports and see who hasn't submitted what, and we can send notifications and communications through the system that then goes to the parents, um, among other things. And so we're excited about this opportunity with the board. Um, approve this, um, approve our contract authority um, as we bring that forward at the next board meeting. Um, this is actually my last slide. I ended with some pictures of our student athletes um, because I always like to have our students in the presentation. I'll take any questions I might be able to answer. Will there be any, um, will systems talk to each other? Will this system reach out and grab the grades or that's still a manual? Um, we are working on integrating it into BCPS1, which is our digital ecosystem. Um, we, um, and so we will, my understanding is we'll have a, we should be, have a way once we have a system-wide license, because one of the things we have to do in order to integrate is our vendor partners have to sign our student data privacy agreements and they've signed that. Um, so that's the first step in us seeing if we can connect things because we can't connect things with companies that don't agree to keep our, our, our student and staff data sacrosanct. So um, that is our first step. Our goal is to fully integrate it so that there is less um, moving between the systems than there is now. But right now, we have a combination. There are so, still some things you need to do on paper. You know, Ms. Shea reminded me, you know, my, my son still had to <laughs> take the physical form to this position um, to get that signed. Um, I guess it was her daughter. I'm, I'm, I'm growing your son up a little bit there. Um, it was her daughter. Um, but there are thin things that we can track electronically. So this is an increased efficiency for parents and students. You. You're welcome. Yes, sir. This works. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. This I thought I could throw you a softball pitch if you'd like <laughs> knock it out the park for me. This is something I have in my toolbox. Mm -hmm. 
and uh, I actually was one of the schools that piloted mm -hmm. when it started, and I, it was a bit of a joke. People always questioned my tech skills. So th it was kind of, if Rod can do this, everybody, everybody can do this <laughs> kind of thing. And it works, and it saves the paperwork. I used to schedule, one summer I scheduled 14 different meetings with parents and students to bring in their paperwork. Mm -hmm. After I implemented this program, I stopped that entirely because they could do it at the convenience of their home on their leisure, mm -hmm. and then I would get an email that they, you know, so-and-so did it. So they would sometimes, if they were having difficulty, I would tell them to do it at school, and you know, during lunchtime or whatever, and they would come, and I'd say, come back to me in a couple minutes after you've done it. And they would come back, and I could say, I got your email, you're good, you're good to go. Mm -hmm. uh, so it, I think, I personally, I think it's an excellent program. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Mack asked me about ally bowling. No, mm -hmm. I asked you what, why, why was softball allied oh. well, there's instead a, of interscholastic. Sure, yeah. that's, a, that's a great question. Yeah, yeah. So, well, children played softball, basketball. Yeah. So right. I've never seen that term. So we, um, you just missed our athletic presentation in the fall. We literally did it in November to the curriculum committee. And I asked Dr. McComas, should we bring it back? It, did, we just did it. But so we have created, and Baltimore County was a leader in creating interscholastic opportunities so that our students with disabilities have the opportunity to also play sports where they might not otherwise qualify in a competitive situation. So the Allied Sports Program is a sports program where disabled and non-disabled students play the sport together. And so that gives them an opportunity to play together. And so we have allied um, softball and bowling. Bowling just ended, um, as a matter of fact. And so um, that is something that we're very proud of, that we make sure that our students with disabilities um, who otherwise may not be able to participate in the interscholastic program get to participate and get to participate with their typical peers. Thank you. You're quite yeah. welcome. And it's also allied soccer. Yes, sir. And then what's interesting is the rosters, and I don't mean to be a know-it-all on this. I just did it for two Oh, please. Years. This is what we, we but Listen, I know when I'm coming with something yeah. that you're going to know exactly what I'm talking about. <laughs> I'm chewing gum. That's why I'm paying attention. <laughs> uh, now we know. But, <laughs> Go ahead. But what's interesting, the rosters, it says that the roster has to be f at least 50% of uh, special needs students. Yes. So, and it cannot be anybody that's already lettered in another sport. So yes. if you had somebody that lettered in soccer, once they've lettered in a traditional sport, they cannot play an allied sport of any kind. Correct. And I've seen some students that, that, get their con that have the skill, they, they start with allied sports, and they have the oh, confidence right. in the skill, mm -hmm. and then they go on. We had one boy that lettered in six sports after that. Uh -huh. Varsity lettered on traditional teams after the, the bowling experience. So it's kind of neat to see them, some of them progress through the system. Sure. So thank yes. you. The other thing we were doing that I didn't mention here because it wasn't quite germane is um, Mr. Sai and his staff and the Office of Athletics have been trying to grow a middle school athletics program. Um, so that is something that we're doing slowly. It takes time um, because it takes, as you know, negotiations to create EDAs for the staff at the middle school to then supervise the athletic program. But that is something else that we recognize, again, as I know you do, that connection, the social emotional connection that the athletic program can have for students and how some students may come to school because they get to play a sport and that might be the reason that I keep a 2.5 GPA where I otherwise may be disengaged so um, wherever we can we're trying to expand those opportunities so thank you for your support thank you very much could we have just one final vote so we have that because <laughs> it sounds like there's support okay thank, thank you, you so much for your time this evening on the is it no further business this meeting is adjourned thank you very much everybody so the next